Well, dear brothers and sisters, one of the most fascinating figures I find of the early 20th century was a man who was five feet, five inches tall, just under 160 pounds, a man relatively small in stature, but one incredible individual, a man by the name of Harry Houdini, Harry Houdini. And for those of you who don't know, Harry Houdini wasn't only the best magician, illusionist, and stunt performer of his day. He practically <laughs> wrote the book on these entertaining trades. Harry Houdini was probably most famous for being an escape artist like no other. This man would draw tens of thousands of onlookers to his live performances, and the people loved to see this guy free himself out of incredibly restrictive situations. And one of Houdini's most popular stunts was to willingly have himself strapped into a regulation straitjacket before he would be suspended upside down, suspended by his ankles from a tall building or crane. And people just flocked all over to see this man try to make his <coughs> escape in full view. Houdini would literally bring traffic to a halt. And Houdini, after systematically exercising a whole series of physically taxing steps that he used to practice over and over and over again, Houdini was able to free himself. Houdini built up this knowledge and physical stamina to free himself out of any straitjacket, again, suspended upside down, and he was able to do so always in less than three minutes. Absolutely incredible. Now, the possibility of failure and death drew the crowds and thrilled them for sure. But at the same time, most people came to witness a man wrapped in heavy-duty bindings. They came to see a man experience dramatic freedom, freedom and victory. And by witnessing these liberating feats, the people themselves experienced vicariously a little bit of that freedom. And so the crowd would roar with applause before going about their day again, spreading the word about this Harry Houdini, this free bird, if you will. Freedom, freedom, brothers and sisters. Freedom is, always has been, and will always remain alluring. Everyone loves freedom. Everyone desires to be more free. But here is a very important thing. There's a huge difference between that authentic liberty, which is intimately wedded to a genuine human flourishing, huge difference between that authentic freedom on one hand and then the counterfeit variety on the other. Authentic freedom, that, that leads to life, the fullness of life that we're designed for. Counterfeit freedom, well, that's just another way of saying enslavement. The two terms are synonymous. And we've got to be oh so careful, brothers and sisters, with eyes wide open. We have to stay alert to see what kind of freedom we're pursuing and why we're pursuing it. Are we trying to break free or be broken free of the straitjacket, whatever it may be? Or by our words, thoughts, actions, habits, our lifestyle, are we just adding to the bindings and the chains and the shackles, whatever those attachments may be, that are further restricting our true freedom and preventing us from experiencing the fullness of life. Friends, at the heart of our readings today at Mass lies freedom, freedom, a freedom that is oriented toward that reception of nothing less than the fullness of life, now, the way this message, this truth is presented may seem to us a little jarring. There are these tall demands and a sense of urgency that are right here in black and white. Jesus says, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God, says Jesus. Okay, wow, it shouldn't surprise us if we feel a little prickled, a little off-put by this statement from our Lord because it's so countercultural. I mean, let me get this straight. I got to put my hand to the plow and I can't look back. 
this doesn't give me many options. This command seems to be restricting my liberty. What if, what if I want to veer to the side? What if I want to do a 180 and turn backwards, journey where I came from? What if I just want to stay stationary, take my hands off the plow, put my feet up, and indulge? Don't I need these options to be truly free? Biblically, the answer is no, no. And we can, we can see the truth in this just from looking at our own lived experience. To excel at any discipline, whatever it may be, from playing the piano, from mastering a foul shot in basketball, to swinging a golf club correctly, to the hours of rigorous apprenticing needed to master a given trade, to the work one has to put into relationships to build trust, and so on and so forth. All of the above necessarily entails work and time, and often a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, all of which paves the way toward not just excellence, but freedom as well. Through our own lived experience, investing that time in any worthwhile endeavor, we come to know quite quickly that physical and mental discipline, sacrificing little pleasures and options, and surrendering to a process, sometimes a rigorous process, of learning, adapting, growing, we come to bear witness to the fact that discipline, healthy discipline, does not at all restrict our freedom. Rather, these factors contribute to that liberty that we're looking for and want more of. And this is exactly what our Lord is getting at in regards to the spiritual life, our moral life, and our life in community. Now, in the world's eyes, freedom in the world's eyes is all about exercising one's own self-determination, one's own autonomy without being held back by anything. You can fulfill your life the way you see fit, says the world. Just exercise your free will. You'll be free. Pleasure is there for the taking. Keep your options open. Have it your way. Have it your way. This is the old slogan for Burger King. Have it your way. You know, but I would say it's the grand, grand slogan for all of secular society. Have it your way and let us help you enjoy your way as much as possible. How? Well, just buy this vehicle, buy these shoes, buy these lottery tickets. Attach yourselves to all these products and these means of escape. Attach yourself to a lifestyle that just sit, stimulates your senses. A lifestyle that puts me, myself, and I first. And God off to the margins. Okay, now, to be sure, self-care. Self-care matters. It's, it is important. And no, being a consumer in the marketplace, it's not intrinsically evil. But what's being advertised to us 24-7, what, what we've been being bombarded with out there is counterfeit. And here's the deal. If this, if this slogan, have it your way, which is articulated in so many different ways out there, if that grand secular slogan is really, does it, if it really contributed to authentic human flourishing, then, then the church would have absolutely no problem endorsing it and amplifying its message so more people could hear it. But that simply doesn't correspond to reality. The church, the church rooted in divine revelation, rooted in the very person of Jesus Christ. The church cannot endorse or promote this self-exalting motto, have it your way, and its endorsement of uninhibited permission. Because what does that lead to? Plain and simple. Nothing less than an enslaving, counterfeit brand of freedom, and quite frankly, a bland existence. This is what it leads to, a short-term short high and a long-term heartache, that heartache. Our freedom, we know our true freedom necessarily involves that surrender to a process, to discipleship, drawing close, learning from, and deepening our relationship with our Lord who, who came to set us free. Real freedom, life-giving freedom. And yes, it's for us, but also it's for the other ones whom our Lord is placing in our lives. 
our Lord, his gift for us. It's meant to flow through us so that others may receive it too. And so, yes, that freedom marked by that vibrancy, it's inextricably linked to surrender, active, faithful, effortful surrender to that law of God, that law of love, following, following the way of our God who loves us. And that way is articulated through morality, the moral law, the way of upright human living, that at its core, it's not restrictive. And added to this, dear friends, here's the great news that Christ and his church is always, always there to unshackle us, to free us from whatever kind of straitjacket we may have on and to lower us down onto that stable ground, that rich soil, that adventurous terrain of the kingdom of God. And there's nothing better. There's nothing better. Nothing even comes close. St. Paul, he testifies to this truth in our second reading today. St. Paul said to his Christian friends in Galatia a couple of millennia ago, and he says it here to us today. He says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. Says St. Paul and St. Peter in his first letter, he echoes these sentiments. St. Peter, he writes, live as free men and women, yet without using your freedom as a pretext for evil, but live as servants of God, says St. Peter. And so, friends, what Saints Peter and Paul are getting at here is that our Lord, our Lord has broken and is breaking our shackles so that we may live in the kingdom of God in the here and now as free people, as free daughters and sons of the Father whose lives were purchased by a man who laid down his life for his friends, for you and me. And what this means is that freedom is here for the taking. Genuine life is available for us, always. It's up for grabs. And we access this by putting God first, putting God first. Yes, yes on Sundays, but every day of the week. No matter what we're going through, no matter how long the checklist is or how busy we are, when we, place, when we place the author of our freedom first, and if we surrender to his loving way, then life happens. Genuine freedom is experienced. The shackles fall off. We pray together. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us.